so let me welcome all of you to our eGrow Friday webinar series. As you know, we are a policy-oriented think tank. We like to do research on policy issues, and we want to make policy recommendations based on solid research. In this webinar series, we invite the best minds that we are aware of in our country and abroad. As you know, we have had speakers from Kennedy School. We are going to have Ricardo Reeves from London School next week. And similarly, across the country, we have the best minds who come and speak to us. And in a way, it's a very educative series. In that context, today, we have Professor Shikhar Kondapali from JNU, and he's going to be speaking to us about China. Today's session is being chaired by our chairman uh, of the Foundation, Dr. Arvind Dhirmani, and I'll hand over now to, to Dr. Arvind Dhirmani to conduct the session further, introduce the speaker, and conduct the proceeding. Dr. Dhirmani, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Charan Singh. So it's my great pleasure uh, to have my colleague, uh, Shrikant, Professor Shrikant. Of course, as uh, you read on the uh, on the website, is professor at the Center for East Asian Studies of JNU. But we have a, a long association. We were founder members uh, of a, a, a national security think tank called the Forum for Strategic Initiatives, uh, and we have been for, I think it's now several years. Uh, uh, of course, during the pandemic, it's kind of been slowed down a little bit, uh, but uh, it's always been a pleasure, uh, you know, uh, talking to him. And it's good that we will have the, uh, so, uh, you know, of course, at FSI, we have been focusing more on economics, which is our uh, bread and butter, so to say. Uh, so this is the first in our series of uh, talks on national security and foreign policy. And having known uh, Professor Srikant for so many years, I thought he would be the best person to inaugurate uh, this uh, section or segment on national security talks. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, uh, you know, maybe uh, when he finishes, I, I'll raise some uh, make some points and, and maybe ask some further questions. Uh, but uh, let me uh, invite you, uh, Srikant, to uh, start the talk. Of course, uh, I, I would just say, I guess, you know, uh, I, I assume you're going to focus, you know, because it's the first in a series that, and, and many of the people here may be ec economic finance type of people. Uh, it would be useful if you give us a perspective on the Chinese, uh, you know, longer term kind of doctrine, strategy, whatever elements, and not focus just on the current uh, situation. Of course, uh, you will probably at the end focus on that. So uh, with that uh, kind of indication, uh, let me turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mani and Professor Charan Singh, um, and to the Foundation uh, for Economic Growth and Welfare. Um, uh, it's really a privilege, and uh, uh, let me also greet the participants. Uh, uh, a very good evening. Uh, so let me begin by saying that the uh, China's increasing assertiveness. Uh, some basic uh, issues here. Um, as you all know, China is the second largest economy in the world and has uh, a roadmap for um, becoming the largest economy in the world in the near future by 2027 uh, if uh, the current growth rates continue, current in the sense of uh, pre-COVID-19 growth rates continue. Uh, so the uh, several estimates, the World Bank estimates, the other estimates have pointed out that China is actually on the way to become the largest economy. But there is still a catch for this which is that China has to uh, um, overcome the middle income trap uh, in order to grow further. And uh, several countries have fallen behind in the middle income trap. So the current effort is to uh, overcome this uh, trap. Uh, there is also the, uh, uh, the other traps like Charles Kinderberger's uh, trap, which is the um, in terms of the maritime domain, uh, the import-export 
uh, areas, uh, they have to really uh, uh, overcome these problems, uh, which is controlled by the United States at the maritime domain. So that is still a major hitch for the Chinese. Um, uh, the other are, of course, it has nuclear weapons. It has uh, the third largest conventional uh, forces. Uh, it also has a huge um, investments abroad, uh, a total investments of $1.7 trillion so far in many countries. Um, uh, so the profile of China is rising. And with that, the assertiveness is also rising. So. Uh, uh, taking a cue from the uh, the chairperson, let me take it back to a slightly uh, longer period. Um, uh, Chinese scholars, Chinese officials, uh, you may have heard about Wolf War diplomacy uh, with Chao Lijian, the foreign ministry spokesperson, uh, entering into a contest with the former U.S. Secretary of State uh, Pompeo uh, in the uh, in various uh, contentious issues. So um, this is uh, what we generally call as exceptionalism. That is uh, American exceptionalism. Uh, America, United States is a superpower. Um, and so it had uh, several exceptional, exceptional uh, aspects like uh, not signing unclause or not following international law in many ways. Um, the Chinese are acquiring this exceptionalism in the recent times, which is uh, uh, proving to be a, a major aspect of uh, the assertiveness um, across the regional and global orders. Um, so when we say assertiveness is linked to power, so uh, the Chinese behavior in terms of power uh, is crucial. So the ancient Chinese uh, have analyzed power uh, in terms of the uh, interests, uh, in terms of projection of state's power. Uh, the legal school in China mentioned about the evil nature of the human being, like much of the Hobbesian uh, nature of the state. Uh, there is the, uh, the, of course, the need for law um, the law to rule the state um, is expressed in the ancient times as a broad idea. Uh, so that is one uh, factor which we need to consider. Second is economic power is also one of the underlying feature of the features of the Chinese civilization. Uh, Kwanzu, who is identified uh, of projecting economic power, uh, as a decisive element in weighing the importance of a state. Uh, and quite appropriately, today, China's economic footprint has expanded substantially. Uh, China is the largest trading partner for about 128 countries uh, and uh, has been investing uh, heavily in many of these countries. Of course, the largest trading partners for China are the United States with over $500 billion. European Union, uh, uh, again, with over $500 billion. Uh, Japan, South Korea, ASEAN countries, and Australia. So the, the largest trading partners uh, through which China earns uh, substantial foreign exchange reserves and has amassed $3.2 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. Uh, in other words, China today has the economic power and through which it has floated the Belt and Road Initiative since 2013 and intends to invest over eight to $900 billion uh, in infrastructure projects, connectivity projects, and so on, which also have an element of assertiveness. For example, the Washington-based CSIS did a study of the BRI in which they mentioned about 93% of the contracts going to the state-owned enterprises. Uh, China is very pushy when it comes to the state-owned enterprises, partly because the 19th Communist Party Congress in 2017, the last Congress, has mentioned about state-owned enterprises as the models to be exported uh, elsewhere in the world. And so China has been assertive in this economic model as well. We will 
talk about the sovereignty and strategic issues in a moment, but the, the economic power is the basis for uh, much of the assertiveness. Uh, of course, it is ruled by the Communist Party and Communist Party leadership has changed uh, more towards the assertiveness. Uh, I will explain that also in a while. The ancient Chinese also spoke about balance of uh, relations between A, B, C, D, and uh, they have coined the vertical and horizontal alliances, much like in realism, realism and neorealism in the IR theories, international relations theories. Uh, uh, one of the things that we can also use in a long-term perspective of that assertiveness is the concentric circles that China builds up uh, across its peripheries, across its neighborhood, across the continents. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, mentioned in an ancient Chinese term, Huaxia Chungxin, Chungxin Chuyi, uh, that is China at the center uh, or middle kingdom status. Uh, till about 1911, when the Qing dynasty collapsed, till about 1911, China practiced the Middle Kingdom status. And today, according to Yang Xuetong, who teaches in the international relations in Tsinghua University, China is reviving the Middle Kingdom syndrome. This is also an explanation for the assertiveness of China by borrowing some of the ancient phenomena, that is the Middle Kingdom status. Uh, secondly, they also are trying to tributary state relations as a part of the middle kingdom status. Uh, many countries before, like Korea, like uh, Ryukyu Islands in Japan, like uh, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, uh, other countries have been tribute paying states, which provides for China to be on the higher table uh, in terms of managing relations with the others. So they have the civilized country status, while others are treated as barbarians uh, in that cultural construct. Of course, with India, they have the concept of Tian Chu or Western heaven. The ancient Chinese uh, termed India as Western heaven, where the monkey king uh, transports a number of these tantric magical traits uh, and provides the link between China and India. But Buddhism also spreads from India, Nepal, Terai regions and uh, into Tibet, rest of China, and then the rest of uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia. So the tributary state relations, which is also being revived, is also at the roots of the assertiveness currently in China. And they're trying to accommodate this into the 20th century model where we have the United Nations led global order uh, or the liberal order since 1945. Uh, also mentioned extensively about the century of humiliation. In order to keep the other countries in the defensive position, they have this concept of century of humiliation. Uh, since 19, uh, since 1842 opium war, the first opium war and the second opium war in 1856, China, Chinese leaders, Chinese statesmen, uh, scholars, others, they mentioned that China declined. Uh, when we look at the Gus Madison, the economic historian's map of the GDP, of global GDP ranking, China and India were at the high level in the GDP structure, uh, but declining after the colonial intervention takes place. So this has taken the discourse of century of humiliation in China. Roughly till 2004, 2005, the century of humiliation concept has been in vogue in the Chinese politics. Uh, this is basically to put the other side on the defensive position, but also in order to regain China's position at the center of the universe, that is, the Middle Kingdom. Um, uh, it is quite um, strange that no Indian leader speaks about the Jallianwala Bagh uh, massacre 
or uh, other recent uh, historical events that India passed through. But in China, the century of humiliation is drilled into every school textbook. Uh, and there is a certain discourse that has become dominant based on this. Uh, let's turn quickly to the leadership. Mao Zedong, who China from 49 till 76, till his death, uh, he consolidated the People's Republic of China through the armed uh, rebellion, armed revolution, uh, and he had also controlled the distant lands when we look at Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, or other regions. The Chinese state expanded into these uh, after the historical uh, disjunctures. There is now the consolidation of all these territories. And the Belt and Road Initiative recently is trying to expand that state power into those who have joined the Belt and Road Initiative projects uh, in terms of expanding the Chinese state influence. Um, leave it aside at the moment. Uh, the contribution of Mao Zedong is also to assert that China is at the center of gravity in Asia. Uh, that is what he mentioned. Uh, uh, and also trying to consolidate through the PLA's support in various wars that China waged in Korean, Korean War in 1951 to 53, or the India-China border war, or the Vietnam War. Uh, so Mao Zedong tried to put China at the center by also focusing on the then superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. And to a large extent, he was successful also in bringing Nixon to Beijing in 1972. Uh, the next leader, Tan Xiaoping, suggested a broader idea called Tao Kuan Yang Hui, that is keeping a low profile. And he put the economics at the center. And with that, China today is the second largest economy by 2010, displacing Japan, and by 2012, displacing Germany as the largest exporting country. Today, they are the largest exporting country. Forget about COVID-19, but overall, in the last decade, they have been the largest exporting country. Um, it is reflected in various parameters. Uh, currently, under Xi Jinping, who took over power in 2012, Xi Jinping went away from Tang Xiaoping's focus on economics and the keeping a low profile, and he fo formulated a policy called accomplish something. Uh, and this is where the assertiveness begins in a more substantial, structured manner. Uh, quickly, let me um, uh, say a few things about the economy uh, to also make the discussion relevant for the foundation. China grew at an on average of 10% growth rate uh, since the launch of reform program, but more essentially from 1990s. Um, uh, in some periods, they have gone beyond 10%, that is in 2007, where they had clocked 14.1% growth rate, but declining to about 96 during the global financial crisis. Uh, they escaped the wrath of the Asian financial crisis in 1997 by tightly controlling the exchange valuation and others. But since the global financial crisis, the economic growth rates have declined um, uh, roughly to 9%, 7%, and 6% in 2014 onwards uh, to the current 2.5% last year during the COVID-19. Uh, before that, they had 5.9% growth rate in 2019. Uh, so the growth rates have declined relatively, but when we look at the American rise in 1820s till 1945, uh, compared to that long period of rise of the U.S., according to Angus Madison, the Chinese rise has been pretty sharp. In just about 30 years, um, from 1978, they grew at, on an average about 10% growth rate, and this has resulted in 
catapulting China to become the second largest economy, uh, not in per capita terms, but in the GDP terms. Uh, today, because of the uh, the import port problems uh, due to uh, supply chain mechanism uh, disruptions and others. Uh, the Chinese now in the 14th five year plan, which is going to be implemented from this year, they have shifted to domestic consumption rather than external exports. So they are tweaking their GDP structure also towards the service sector, um, which is less polluting and probably also an answer to create a middle class. Uh, innovation competitiveness is also being increased in the Chinese uh, economic uh, and capital exports are through the AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Silk Road Fund and others, but also in the energy sector globally. And in a way in economic field, the assertiveness is seen in these investments and later on protection of these investments is to be followed up. Um, the, uh, so that's briefly the economic profile. Um, so let me summarize this by saying China rise can be factored in in terms of its GDP, which is currently around $14 trillion. Uh, foreign exchange reserves are at around $3.2 trillion. And it had conducted several new initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative since 2013. Uh, and it has also floated with other countries like India, the AIIB, and the new development of Bank of the BRICS, uh, which is to finance several soft infrastructure projects and others. Uh, resources wise, China is investing heavily in the energy sector, but also in other sectors in the recent times. Um, uh, as I just mentioned, the $1.7 trillion of outward investment. There was a go out policy in economic field, in investment field, and since 2002, there has been a sharp increase in the Chinese investments abroad. Um, China is planning to celebrate two centennials, the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party in July this year, and also the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China by 2049. And they have laid down the projects till 2049, in which they also suggested to the um, uh, socialist modernization to be realized with the world-class military, uh, meaning thereby that they will have global operations. And partly here we see the assertiveness of China, the blueprint, the groundwork that is being prepared. Uh, two uh, indicators further. One is in terms of the foreign policy uh, and where assertiveness can be factored in. Second is the military policy, which is also an area where we need to focus on in terms of explaining the assertiveness. Uh, China conducted the Central Conference on Work Relating to Foreign Affairs five times so far in the last 70 odd years. Um, First one was held in 1971, second one was held in 1991, but we have more details about the third meeting in which Hu Jintao, the then president, mentions about mutually beneficial win-win strategy. Uh, whenever Chinese use win-win, they want to win twice on the other countries. Uh, so uh, that is one. Uh, the fourth meeting was crucial, and this is where the assertiveness becomes much more structured. This meeting was held in 2014, the fourth meeting of the uh, work relating to foreign affairs, uh, in which the, the Chinese president, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, suggested China protecting legitimate rights and interests. Legitimate rights now, as you know, China has already become the second largest economy. Legitimate rights would then mean that wherever China's footprint has increased, so, China today is asserting in those areas. Legitimate rights include sovereignty rights. It includes the investments abroad. It includes the maritime. It includes uh, various others. Um, China started saying we are become we have become big country in terms of economy, etc. 
and so we have legitimate rights and interests that we need to protect. So flag following trade indirectly is what the suggestion there was. Uh, secondly, in this meeting in 2014, Xi Jinping said uh, that China will oppose the arbitrary use of force by other countries. Um, so when China uses force, it is not defined as arbitrary. For example, in Galwan, as we saw last year, but if other countries use force, that is termed as arbitrary in nature. Uh, for example, in South China Sea or on Sankaku Islands or on other areas. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, we need to understand the, these nuances in Chinese discourse. Um, thirdly, Xi Jinping also said, China needs to make, Chinese diplomacy needs to make efforts to seek other countries' understanding of and support to China dream, uh, which is about peace, development, cooperation, win-win uh, outcomes. Uh, however, what is important here is China dream includes all the legitimate interests and uh, uh, rights that China proposed, including Tibet, Taiwan, South China Sea, so on and so forth. So China today insists on other countries declaring all of these as part of China. Um, uh, for example, uh, last year, last two, three years, Xinjiang issue has become a crucial area of contestation between Western countries and China, Western countries led by the US. Over 25 countries have introduced a, um, uh, a uh, certain bill in the United Nations and other bodies criticizing China's track record in Xinjiang. Uh, and last, uh, in January, uh, the former US Secretary of State on the final day of his office, he mentioned about the genocide charge on China. Now, China, of course, denies this. And this is where we probably will see uh, much of the contestation happening. But most important, over 55 countries oppose these 25 countries which have presented the human rights record in Xinjiang. Islamic countries in the Middle East uh, and other countries. So uh, seeking other countries' understanding of and support to the China dream, uh, China uses many of these innocuous words, uh, but when we come to the details, all of these are part of the details, that is the China's core interests, legitimate interests, and so on and so forth. Um, for instance, some countries in Africa who have no maritime connection at all were also forced to acknowledge that South China Sea, the entire South China Sea belonged to that of China. Uh, so that is where the assertiveness uh, is reflected. Um, in this meeting, Xi Jinping also suggested to reform of international institutions uh, and increasing representation of China and other countries. So, as you know, the in the IMF reorganization since 2010, the International Monetary Fund, China's voting rights have increased from 3% to over 6%. Uh, and, of course, today they are opposing the G7 expansion uh, to include India, South Korea, or other countries. Um, so that is where the tensions would also increase in the international institutions. Um, uh, they have also mentioned protecting China's overseas interests and continuing to improve the capacity to provide such protection. So that's in the maritime domain and much of the assertiveness is actually reflected in the maritime domain in the recent times. Uh, in 2009 onwards, China had formulated a two ocean strategy, Indian Ocean strategy and Pacific Ocean strategy. Uh, flowing from this, they have been expanding their maritime footprint and that has created a lot of tensions with the other countries. Um, uh, uh, the last meeting of the Foreign Affairs Work Conference was held in June 2018 in Beijing. Xi Jinping once again addressed this in this meeting, he introduced 
the factor that Chinese diplomacy should uh, promote socialism with Chinese characteristics under the new era. Uh, and we do not know what exactly this connotes, but it is suggested that the new era would include China as the second largest economy and protection of its uh, legitimate rights and interests and so on and so forth. Uh, in this meeting, Xi Jinping suggested that Chinese diplomacy should act in a strategic self-confidence manner and maintain strategic determination. Uh, again, it is difficult to translate what exactly does that mean. But when we look at the embassies of China abroad, many of these are practicing, and this is where the Wolf War diplomacy is uh, a, uh, an offshoot. Um, then he also mentioned about the strategic planning and global deployment of the diplomatic core. And finally, he also mentioned the 19th Party Congress um, key uh, takeaway, that is community of common building, uh, common destiny. Uh, that China needs to build in which others would be treated as partners or even allies in future. Uh, let me turn quickly to the military. China released 10 white papers on the defense sector, and the most crucial ones are the recent ones, the 2015 and 2019 white papers. The 2015 white paper mentions about China's military effectively securing China's overseas interests. So that's where the Navy footprint has increased. Uh, it also suggested to safeguarding China's security interests in new domains, that is in cyberspace and maritime, uh, which is where we saw Huawei 5G uh, and other cyber related aspects coming in. The 2019 white paper criticized the US hegemony, but it also laid the footprint for the assertiveness of China in the longer run. Uh, they mentioned about several fundamental interests of China that needs to be pursued, which includes the deterring and resisting aggression, uh, assuming that some country is trying to invade China, uh, which is a tall order because of the deterrence capabilities of China. Yet, this is the picture that China paints, uh, deterring and resisting aggression, uh, safeguarding its national political security, uh, which meaning thereby the Communist Party security or regime security, people security and social stability. That is social stability here basically means no, um, uh, no demonstrations or others. Um, this is basically to oppose any colored revolutions that have happened in the Eurasian region or in Myanmar or other areas. Um, uh, it also mentions about Taiwan. It also mentions about a host of other areas that we just discussed. Uh, quickly, let me then focus on the key areas of assertiveness briefly, one on Taiwan. Uh, China says that the Kuomintang lost the, the uh, civil war in 1949 and fled to Taiwan and so reunification has to be uh, uh, to be made. Uh, and China does not recognize Taiwan as a separate entity and has proposed several uh, military takeover, which they failed, economic takeover, again, they failed uh, in putting across the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, ECFA, a kind of FTA uh, that has, that they have not been able to cobble up because of the sunflower movement in Taiwan, uh, the students, people, uh, common people opposing such uh, agreements with, with China. Um, briefly then, let me also quickly mention about South China Sea, and I'm willing to take all these into in a Q&A. I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm quickly mentioning these. Um, China claims the 3.4 million square kilometers, 80% of that, uh, by historical means uh, that during Ming Dynasty, they discovered some coins. And so the Chinese say that the whole area belongs to them. Uh, 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 in India, nobody said the Chola Empire, which expanded to various regions, that all belong to that of India, uh, taking a cue from China or other countries. Uh, um, uh, 
so south china sea is still burning uh, china had uh, some thousand acres of built up area according to the csis think tank estimates it has now nine reefs which are militarized and it wants to impose an air defense identification zone senkaku islands which are administered by the japanese also are contested by china recently uh, again the same logic that historically these belong to that of china um, although this now comes under the us japan treaty guidelines uh, alliance guidelines so this becomes quite uh, complicated in a way uh, but senkaku islands is also one of the major assertive areas for china in the recent times and about a few weeks ago they have also said the coast guard chinese coast guard could also fire in certain circumstances uh, in the senkaku islands and other areas uh, we just completed the disengagement process in pankungso lake uh, but since last year china's assertiveness is reflected when india is trying to tackle the covid-19 china surreptitiously entered into this region and put up nearly 60000 troops in this uh, western sector of ladakh opposite to aksai chin uh, i will explain if there are any further questions on this i'm um, uh, australia also bore the brunt of china's assertiveness uh, let me quickly assess the assertiveness by saying that it has limitations in the longer run partly because china's economic assertiveness also is in a way hollow because the per capita income is pretty low um, china claims it has 9700 dollars per capita income but last may li kachiang the premier mentioned 600 million people in china are having an income of 140 dollars um, so huge disparity in terms of gini coefficient and others secondly china is heavily reliant on imported energy and resources minerals and so on which is the maritime stocks sea lanes of communications are dominated by us or other regional powers um, then there is also the convertibility of renminbi chinese currency which is very uh, at a at a very low level uh, in terms of the other universal currencies as part of the belt and road initiative china wanted to put this as an internationalized uh, currency but today there is uh, 1% um, uh, of the uh, share of the foreign exchange reserves are in this uh, in this uh, format uh, while us dollar the euro the japanese yen british pound other currencies have been the universal currencies Uh, there is a problem still with the renminbi internationalization um, uh, for the economic assertiveness uh, china also lacks independent technologies uh, for instance when huawei restrictions took place in the us and they banned se several semiconductors there is a huge problem for china although they have launched a made in china 2025 project uh there is also the per capita clean water availability uh, limited in china despite the diversion of rivers in tibet and other regions grain output grain stockpile is also very limited in china uh, and they have also been uh, demographic changes china is becoming a gray society from last year uh, and the labor uh, is also becoming problematic Uh, in china in terms of the environmental issues are also a concern uh, which could deplete the assertiveness in the longer run uh, also domestic political stability is also a key feature some uncertainties about the assertiveness is in terms of the uh, the political problems within china uh, ethnic conflict tibet xinjiang inner mongolia and other areas or even political dissent which is also increasing secondly coastal versus interior ethnic unrest as i just mentioned the uh, the strategic outreach could also be limited by us or other powers like what we saw in the quad quadrilateral uh, discussions finally let me say that uh, china is trying to assert in all domains political economic strategic uh, so on um, 
but this is an arduous task. Uh, if the other countries who are victimized could uh, make an alliance, make a, uh, they can range against China in various aspects, uh, specifically in South China Sea, East China Sea, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, which is where much of the wealth of China is located. Um, power transition is one aspect of that assertiveness, uh, but we see that this is going to be a very complex factor. Uh, there are opportunities, of course, for China in terms of integration, economic integration, market potential, security provider, so on and so forth, but challenges are innumerable. Uh, so let me stop here by saying that it's a mixed mix bag China is trying to assert, but there are also other countries which are also coming up and opposing China. We just saw the one year mobilization by both countries, China and India. And finally, China has to blink uh, in this round. Uh, so they have vacated the Pan Kung So by today morning uh, and uh, the other friction points are to be taken. So let me stop here and take questions from you. Thank you, okay. Professor. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, please, sir, everybody, please keep your uh, cell phone mute. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think what is really uh, fascinating and good, you, uh, I'm glad you, because it's the first in our series, I wanted to give people a kind of historical perspective. I'm very happy uh, you've done that because, you know, we are not China experts uh, myself, though I follow China very closely. But that historical perspective, I think, will stand us in good stead as the first, uh, uh, you know, initial talk. I'm sure we'll have more uh, talks on uh, on China. Uh, so uh, let let me. I, I have three uh, issues which I have myself uh, talked about, and I would just, uh, you know, uh, ask you to kind of give your perspective. I mean, you you can choose uh, how much or what you want to say. There are really three things. Uh, which when I uh, listen to the China discourse, uh, read other experts, etc., which uh, come. W one is something which bothers me. What I feel is that many uh, China experts who are uh, who, who know the deep history of China tend to underplay uh, the role of 70 years of communism, Communist Party uh, rule in China, you know, and give more emphasis to historical. Uh, you know, uh, the, the cultural history, etc. So that is one thing, just your reaction. Uh, the, the second one, uh, which I, I think is very important, uh, and again, which you can just give, so to lay it on the table, so to say your uh, view, is is this uh, so-called, uh, what I refer to as S-read strategy uh, of, of, of the Communist Party of uh, China, Communist rule China, where S stands for a spy or steal, a small s, and read, reverse engineer, uh, and develop. So you did mention something about technology. Uh, I personally feel its own achievements are overdone because we neglect that their, much of their expertise, at least uh, for uh, you know, uh, the past uh, early 25 years, was really on this S-read. I mean, this get, got formalized a couple of years ago, but that's what they've always pursued, in my view. So just some uh, reaction of yours. And finally, uh, uh, this you may not, uh, you know, because it's more economics, I just want to put it on uh, on the table, uh, that uh, people, in my view, the China experts, uh, I'm talking about economists now, not you who are a broader uh, political, geopolitical one, is not appreciated what I call the party sector, which really started with the TVs. They, they were not SOEs. They were not private sector. They were all uh, provincial uh, initiated uh, organizations which were run by party members. Uh, so the party sector, and this has come, uh, you know, there have been many little indications. The biggest one is now Ant Financial, where uh, it's come out finally that many of the owners of this company are actually close relatives of uh, uh, the Shanghai uh, party. So uh, I've always called this, uh, you know, from 2006, my economic paper, that there is this huge sector which foreigners think of as private sector is not really private. It's run by uh, party members, uh, their friends, et cetera, et cetera. So just on these three uh, issues, if you just want to give some, uh, you know, some comments and then we can move on to the questions. 
Uh, sure, thank you very much. Um, to start with the last point on the uh, uh, the party state uh, influence in the uh, enterprises, uh, there are two types. One is the state-owned enterprises, which of course are completely with the party. Um, party heads the state-owned enterprises and they have over 100 state-owned enterprises, big ones. Uh, let me just mention the PetroChina, uh, something like our ONGC. Uh, its turnover is $1.2 trillion. Uh, that's about one third of the Indian GDP. Uh, you can imagine the kind of state-owned enterprises that they built up. And the state-owned enterprises also have party representation, which means basically they send party uh, deputies to the National Party Congress once in five years so that they can select the general secretary of the party. So. Um, uh, unlike in India, where the uh, the the uh, PSUs uh, are headed by IAS officers, uh, in the case of uh, China, it is headed by party. Uh, of course, they are professional, like uh, management background and economics background and so on. For instance, the China Development Bank, which is a state-owned bank, uh, uh, headed by professionals, of course, uh, but also has the party link. The second is the SMEs or MSMEs, uh, medium and small uh, enterprises. Um, the Chinese GDP, 60% of that is produced by the MSMEs, uh, while state-owned enterprises, collective enterprises, everything put together is rest 40%. So China's GDP, the private sector contributes the majority of the portion. But the devil is in the detail. Uh, Chiang Zemin, when he took over in 1989, he introduced a new law in which every um, enterprise which employs more than seven people should have a party committee. So in other words, if you take, say, uh, Wusha fans or um, say, uh, whatever the, uh, the, the small enterprises and um, they will have a party committee if they employ more than seven people. So in other words, the thumb rule is every enterprise because even a small restaurant today employs more than seven people. Uh, yeah. Even a small establishment has more than seven people. So it should have a party committee. So since then, the, the small and medium enterprises or medium enterprises, they have a party committee and so everybody is a party member including Jack Ma for example uh, or uh, Ren Cheng Fei the Huawei uh, chief chief executive officer the Huawei Fai, Huawei telecommunication company or any other company in China so state owned enterprises headed by the party the MSME is headed by the party uh, so essentially we don't have a pure private sector uh, in China by this uh, definition. Uh, number one, the, uh, when the reform began, uh, reform began in 78 with the four modernizations program in agriculture, industry, SNT, and defense. So initially, the, in Sichuan province, they began with sideline production. Uh, that is, if you have the minimum quota for the uh, Food Corporation of India-like body in China, the quota, uh, the farmers then can um, um, go to the market. Uh, something like a farmer's hesitation today, uh, they have settled this to in the 1970s by sideline production. So they can go to the market, they can, um, all the vegetables or commercial crops, etc. they can sell it to the market. Uh, and then after capital was formed in agriculture, they shifted towards the TVEs, uh, township and village enterprises. Uh, and the TVEs actually performed very well during the 80s, but there is a plateauing of the TVEs uh, since the 2000s. Uh, so today, the e-commerce platforms uh, are growing substantially and increasing their uh, overall national uh, economic uh, scale, et cetera. 
So in the light of this, as you rightly mentioned about the and financial, here the crucial thing is about the party rather than about the, uh, the uh, uh, pure uh, private or other considerations. Uh, it is the party state which dictates and that is where uh, we need to. The second uh, issue on the SV, uh, uh, spying, reverse engineering, uh, et cetera. Uh, in this process, um, in 1950s, the Soviet Union transferred them about 156 uh, main uh, enterprises, uh, basically in heavy industry, like our Bokaro steel factory or some such um, examples. So out of these 156 projects, the Chinese were able to industrialize. Uh, and uh, with the reform program and with the American blessings, the European blessings, the Japanese, the Koreans, the, uh, the, uh, the flying geese model, uh, mm. they adopted to this and export-oriented bodies were made in China. So one of the key issues here is technology transfers. Uh, initially, reverse engineering, but there is now a lot of technology transfers. Led by the Americans, again, there are 70,000 American MNCs in China today. Uh, and uh, as a part of the joint venture, China cajoles all these companies to share their blueprints, including their technologies, their, their IPRs. Uh, intellectual property rights. So this is the main grouse of the European Chambers of Commerce that they are forced to part away with some of these technologies. So it is still relevant on the reverse engineering that China is conducting. And in the controversy related to Huawei in US and ZTE, Chungxing, uh, we came to know that the the Chinese are still dependent on semiconductors um, from US or from Taiwan. So independent technology is very hard to find in China, although there is a lot of effort to digest the technologies. Uh, and in the low level, low technology level, China had already digested. And in the made in China 2025, they wanted to graduate to artificial intelligence, drones, um, Internet of Things, 3D printing, and other technologies, uh, space, and so on. So that is uh, a quick answer for the second question. On the history of the Communist Party, uh, so by July this year, they will be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party, which was incidentally set up by the Comintern, Communist International, uh, when Stalin proposed uh, these for the... Uh, developing countries, including in India, by the, the CPI was also formed uh, around the same time. Uh, so, so you have the party superimposed on the society. Uh, so in terms of civilization, etc., depending on the party's policies, the society either suffered or prospered. Uh, for instance, the party proposed during the Cultural Revolution of abolishing all the four O's. So as a result, the civilization suffered. In many ways, the culture suffered. But Chiang Zemin also introduced the three represents in which he mentioned one of the represents is the Communist Party should represent the advanced culture of China, which is Confucianism. So today there is a lot of revival of the Confucius ideas. Neo-Confucianism has come to the fore. So I would say that the Communist Party is today trying to link up with the cultural background of China. Uh, and of course, they are identifying more Confucianism, uh, the Taoism or other indigenous and a nationalist streak within China. They also argue that China should not be heavily dependent on Buddhism because it originated in India. So there is, there is within culture, there is also the indigenous uh, uh, element that is being stressed. Uh, let me stop here on this. Questions in the chat box. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, okay, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, private sector, we have just talked. Uh, so, okay, we can now come to contemporary. There's a question on China, uh, Ch uh, China's uh, and uh, USA, and, and how their view may have changed from Trump to Biden, kind of a contemporary question on China's views on USA from Trump to Biden, kind of. But we, as we have as limited time, maybe you can be now start being brief, uh, I guess, as uh, you know, it's yeah. difficult, but please go ahead. Yeah, well, um, Trump focused mainly on tariff wars, uh, but also inclusive of issues on Xinjiang, Tibet. The Tibet Policy Support Act was passed on December 27th, uh, made it into a law. There is also the Taiwan Travel Act. Uh, there is the arms sales to Taiwan. Um, on South China Sea, there is the uh, Trump administration sent the uh, US naval vessels closer to the 12 nautical miles of the Chinese occupied reefs. Uh, on the islands, there is a clarification on the alliance uh, provisions between US and Japan. Uh, so let me summarize the Trump administration into these issues and how would Biden uh, probably uh, foresee. Uh, we have seen some uh, softening of position of Biden on Xinjiang. Um, uh, yesterday, there was a speech by Biden on the uh, Xinjiang related, where he mentioned that China had to go, had to go through uh, a century of humiliation, et cetera. Uh, and uh, much of these is inflicted by the West. So they have their own legitimate concerns uh, on ethnic issues and so on and so forth. So it appears that Biden may, uh, may uh, go beyond the genocide charge that the Trump administration uh, imposed on, uh, mentioned on China. Uh, so that is one possible. But we may not see much of uh, let down by Biden on South China Sea. Uh, or on Taiwan, because they have been prioritized in the Biden administration. Uh, not on Quad, on the quadrilateral uh, security dialogue, we just saw yesterday morning, the third uh, uh, foreign ministerial meeting. Um, so uh, Biden may not uh, lower the guard on these issues. Um, in terms of China rise, till Obama administration, all of the American presidents since Clinton have welcomed the rise of China. But since Trump administration, they have at least late Trump, we have seen restrictions by Trump on that so-called China rise. So we may possibly see similar views in the Biden administration because the US Congress has a bipartisan consensus on the China policy, and we may possibly see some restrictions by the Biden administration on China. Okay, two more questions. Let me just read them out. Uh, one is on uh, China's uh, defense spending and India and how in, uh, India is going to uh, address the assertiveness in South Asia. So that's more of a contemporary. That's fine. You can take that. The second question is uh, related to kind of in the context of the uh, economic war with uh, China now reacting on this rare earths. Uh, you know, of course, uh, Trump had all these things imposed, the tariffs, etc. So I guess the question is saying now that China is kind of reacting with uh, restrictions on rare earth. Uh, how, I guess, in a way, how what will be done? What will happen? How will this proceed? So uh, you can take these as you wish. These two questions. Um, uh, thank you very much for those uh, rising defense expenditure in China. Uh, well, there are various estimates. The official estimate is about $220 billion, uh, but we know that it is fudged. There is a lot of cooking of the books in China on the defense because many sectors are not included in this space program, which has military applications. The law and order situation, which also has some military component um, uh, and so on and so forth. So. The RAND Corporation, the CIPRI, the uh, others have estimated to roughly about 
250 to 300 billion dollars um, uh, China's defense uh, uh, so that is far above compared to the 50 odd billion dollars that India spends so six times the Chinese spend on the defense uh, um, uh, items uh, now having said that how would the, how that would impact on South Asia, India, and so on? We just wound up the Pankungso Lake um, friction point uh, today. Uh, the whole episode indicates that even if you are spending a trillion dollars, you will have to fight those those fights in the heights, uh, and none of these trillions of dollars would really work uh, because the boots on the ground have to be made and the defenses in the hilly regions have a different ball game altogether. So what we witnessed in the Galwan aftermath is regardless of how much you are spending, of course, that would be beneficial in terms of your high tech gadgets or others. The Chinese were advertised, the People's Daily, the Global Times, they advertised that um, the, uh, the frontline troops were having hotspot by the drones, uh, but we did not see the valor uh, after eating the hotpot by these Chinese troops. Uh, ultimately, they have to withdraw um, uh, uh, from Pankungso Lake at the moment. Uh, so this suggests that regardless of how much you are spending, the warfare nature is slightly different. Uh, and India has robust defense uh, deterrence capability and so that is what has come has ultimately resulted in the situation as we saw in Ladakh uh, today uh, number one number two in terms of South Asia the rising defense spending by China has reflected in in terms of arms sales to many South Asian countries Pakistan in particular but also to Bangladesh Sri Lanka uh, or even Nepal. Uh, so this is one impact. The second is um, many of these South Asian countries have agreements with India. For example, Sri Lanka on the maritime cooperation, Nepal in 1951 with the treaty that we signed on friendship uh, or uh, other countries. So this is another impact that China is providing an alternative incentive to these countries to uh, counter India in a way. Uh, in many ways, we saw during the uh, the last six months in Nepal, or during the Rajapaksa term in Sri Lanka. Uh, so this suggests that the the defense expenditure and broadly the PLA modernization could have an impact on South Asia uh, uh, broadly. Um, there could be other uh, uh, due to paucity of time. I'm not able to explain. Uh, and the other question was on uh, um, on the uh, the kind of uh, uh, trade war or with rare earths and those sort of things. Uh, yes, trade war. Yeah, yeah. The uh, Chinese first uh, banned the rare earth metals with Japan somewhere in 2003, uh, and uh, uh, that has led to uh, Manmohan Singh government signing an agreement on the rare earth metal supplies. To Japan, um, so so we had advance notice of the Chinese restrictions on the rare earth metals uh, because they produce 90 odd percent of global rare earth metals. So this is an area which has been contentious. But after the uh, the Chinese ban, California started reviving its rare earth metal industries. Uh, India started reviving. All of these were shut down because Chinese were supplying at a cheaper rate. Uh, so now we are all reviving those rare earth metal. Uh, it is a major issue in terms of sudden disruptions, uh, in terms of the trade and uh, the uh, supply chain mechanism. Um, but nevertheless, I think there are uh, other parties who are coming into the fore in exporting the rare earth metals. So hopefully, we will probably see other suppliers uh, in the near future. Okay, there's a Mr. Tripathi from the Ennadu newspaper. So I will allow him to ask his own question. Mr. Tripathi? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Kondapalli just wanted to ask you, uh, what do you make of Chinese decision to disengage at this point of time? Because Chinese uh, certainly cannot be trusted uh, in the long run. And how India can use Taiwan car to tame China in long run? Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. The first one is uh, related to the current events in Pankungso Lake and others. Um, we have a written agreement after the 10th and 9th core commander level meeting. Uh, the ninth one was in January and uh, there were back channel diplomacy that happened. And finally, we have an agreed uh, framework um, in terms of uh, where to uh, disengage, what kind of procedures to follow. Uh, it is well written uh, by both the site, sites. And so, uh, so it is binding on both sides. Uh, of course, we can say that there were previous agreements between India and China, 93, 96, 2005, 2013, uh, but care about those agreements. So it is quite possible China could renege on those agreements, on this agreement as well, uh, and uh, uh, escalate the situation on the borders. It is quite possible, but uh, probably this is a last chance uh, for China to uh, to observe those agreements that we signed. Uh, and secondly, the agreement that we signed is in detail. Uh, the previous agreements were broad by saying war is not an instrument for resolving the territorial dispute as in the 93 agreement or in 96 agreement, you should not have exercises with the line of actual control as the focus. In 2005, 2013, specifically 2013, there is no tailing of the patrols. So these were signed, but these were not very specific. Uh, but the current agreement is a specific written agreement. So which means let us see uh, some things prevails in China uh, in not uh, um, activating the border dispute and so on, number one. Number two, we also have the, um, uh, India had indicated in the current round that its deterrence capabilities are credible enough. Uh, the Army Chief General Narawane mentioned we will not vacate the Kailash Ranges. Uh, it's a straightforward message to China. Uh, the Indian Air Force Chief mentioned that if China can be aggressive, India can also be aggressive. Um, and Raksha Mantri said, uh, we will protect sovereignty till the last inch. Uh, so all these suggested that there is no go for China. Uh, they have to stay back. All those 60,000 troops they mobilized will have to stay back in the minus 40 degrees centigrade. Uh, so there is no go for China uh, and they have hold up these many troops in this area. On the other hand, because of China's assertiveness in South China Sea or on Taiwan or on Senkaku Islands or on other areas, the Chinese also have huge allocations, military allocations. And if the situation would have continued in Ladakh, Aksai Chin region, then China would have been in a disadvantageous position. Um, you may have seen that Pakistan did not escalate much in the current standoff, uh, so which suggested that India had a relatively more uh, favorable position in this, and so finally China has to demobilize, uh, uh, disengage in this sector. Uh, so that's broadly the first. The second is on Taiwan. To what extent can we go? Um, in 1950, we signed an agreement with China on one China policy. Uh, and uh, in 2009, when Manmohan Singh visited China, he, is, he also um, uh, in the joint statement mentioned that both countries oppose any activity which is opposed to Taiwan's independence. Uh, so in other words, India had agreed to one China policy but without any uh, reciprocal arrangement with China. So the former foreign minister, Sushma Swaraj, 
asked her counterpart, Wang Yi, that we have signed the One China policy. What about the One India policy? Uh, now, there was no response from China. Uh, of course, reciprocity in international relations is an instrument of power. Uh, how much power you have, you also impose your position on the other. But with the current standoff being cleared, uh, it is now on the part of India to drive this message to China that unless until China accepts the One India policy, One India broadly, including Kashmir, including Northeast, or including any other core interests, uh, uh, positing this against the One China policy. Uh, if we do not get the reciprocal uh, concessions from China on this issue, India can also open up the One China policy, including on Taiwan, including on Tibet. Because in diplomacy, it is not a charity. It's about your protecting your national interests. So it is quite possible that we may revive based on the compatibility between One India, One China policies, we may raise the issue of Taiwan in the future. Uh, that is quite possible. If the Chinese do not relent on this, then we may possibly, I'm saying this because China had taken Kashmir issue to the United Nations Security Council uh, four times in the last one and a half years. Uh, and it has been through its assertive policies in South Asia, has been into, into this, uh, uh, influence area. So, this is quite possible that India may up the ante on the one China policy uh, and posit the one India policy in future. So based on that, I would see some changes in India on Taiwan. Uh, and Taiwan in its own right, Taiwan has 40% global hardware, IT hardware. Uh, Taiwan also is a very professional place in terms of many uh, activities. So no country would tend to forego uh, such kind of association with Taiwan. So in other words, India would explore, India already is exploring in the economic and technological sphere in uh, uh, clubbing up with Taiwan. Uh, there is this IT, India-Taiwan uh, configuration that has come about some years ago, uh, although it is currently only in the economic and technological sphere. We may also see in future about the political aspects. That depends on whether China follows the One India policy. Thank you, uh, Professor. I think there's a lot more interest than probably we anticipated, but I think we have to end now. Maybe we'll have another session more focused on uh, specific issues uh, at a later date. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the session. Uh, Charan, you want to say some concluding words? First of all, I want to thank Professor Srikant Kondapalli to inaugurate our series on national security. And uh, there couldn't have been a better person than you, Professor, because the depth of knowledge that you have had and the explanations that you gave are so good and things were so clear and articulate that I'm sure our participants, the ones who have attended today and the ones who are going to be listening on the weekend, uh, are really going to benefit. So I want to thank you from the core of my heart. I also want to thank Dr. Virmani who chaired the session today and his own expertise on national security and on China is so well known. And so therefore I think it was great listening to both of you. I want to make an announcement that the recording for today's event will be available tomorrow by noon and we'll upload it on our website. We'll send a copy to as many people as you know, we do generally to most of the participants and professor will send you also a copy so you could use it. Uh, I want to make an important as announcement also about the next week's event. Next week, Professor Ricardo Rees, PhD from Harvard and now a professor at London School of Economics is going to be talking to us on the monetary fiscal nexus. Just about a few months back, Professor Ricardo was invited by BIS, Bank for International Settlement, to also make a presentation on a similar topic. So I would invite all of you 
to please come and benefit from this knowledge series that we have started for the last few months. With this, let me conclude now and once again thank the speaker, the chairman and the participants to have spent time with us on this Friday evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.